You're listening to the Psychedelic Invest Podcast, where we speak with founders, CEOs, investors, advisors, experts, and thought leaders in the brave new world of psychedelics and entheogenic medicines. Brought to you by Psychedelic Invest, bringing you unparalleled psychedelic investing data and analysis. Psychedelic Invest is the industry's leading resource for those looking to invest in the burgeoning psychedelic industry. For more information and to access all of the podcast episodes, check out our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast. And now here's the host of the Psychedelic Invest podcast, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is the Psychedelic Invest podcast. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. Our guest today is Neil Markey. He is co-founder and CEO at Beckley Retreats. We're going to talk about the world of psychedelic therapy, psychedelic experiences, and really the importance of kind of taking a holistic approach and really kind of understanding what goes into creating a a great experience, an effective experience, a therapeutic experience, and the work that they're doing to to really support that and make that happen. And really kind of talking about where we are with psychedelics, like what do we know, what do we not know, what are we kind of learning around the process? Obviously, this is an evolving area and a lot happening. A lot of people learning a lot of interesting things. I'm excited about this because I think this whole retreat idea is, you know, a really important uh, part of what we're developing or, or where we're learning a lot about the use of psychedelics and the benefits and the kind of the power and the impact of psychedelics. So I'm excited for this. With all that, Neil, welcome to the program. Thank you, Bruce. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Before we dive into everything you're doing with Beckley today and kind of the the programs you're running. Let's get a little bit of the background. I'm curious on how you got involved in this. What was the backstory? I mean, I know you've got a really kind of interesting background professionally, but I'd love to learn like how you got involved in psychedelics and how that inspired or kind of led you to be being part of Beckley and the work that you're doing today. Yeah, I'll try and keep it short. It's been a windy road, <laughs> but um, yeah, it all happened. You know, it started kind of September 11th. I um, ended up leaving my undergrad program and joining the service just felt that the country was at risk and we needed to do our patriotic duty. And next thing you know, I ended up in the military and um, I did one trip to Iraq with the, with the big army as an infantry officer. And then I got picked up and was in the Ranger regiment and did two deployments to Afghanistan. And, um, you know, I was really fortunate. I was an officer and I was more of the support role. So I was I was distanced from the the major combat, but it was still quite traumatic. You know, the there was guys getting hurt overseas quite frequently, yeah. and there was just a lot of trauma in the organization. You know, that they had been deploying pretty much nonstop since September 11th. You know, when I was on my first Ranger deployment, a lot of the guys were on their 10th, 11th, 12th, and um, wow, it was intense. And at one point in time, we had three suicides in 90 days. It was so bad that there was a congressional investigation into the unit because they thought. The politicians thought that there was leadership failures, but, Mm -hmm. you know, the leadership there was actually saying, you know, this is actually what happens, you know, when you send young men to war without pause for a decade. And so it left some marks on me, although I was, I was really fortunate and I got out, I went to Columbia university for graduate school and, you know, I was doing well outside looking in. I was at a really good school. I had been a pretty highly ranked officer. And in my first mm-hmm. year at school, I was getting job offers at places like McKinsey and BCG. And But inside, I was miserable. I was, I was yeah. really struggling. And I had tried lots of different traditional approaches, different SSRIs and anti-anxiety medications, and none of that worked. And the first thing that I found that was kind of non-traditional a gentleman that I met, I think, saw how much I was struggling, and he taught me how to meditate. Oh, interesting. And meditation was was pretty transformative. And then through that same network, um, I had my first ceremonial use of psilocybin about 10 years ago, and that was kind of the beginning of me going down this path. And there's been lots of twists and turns since, but that was the start, was psilocybin was, was a very powerful part of kind of my healing journey and coming out of the military. Yeah. I'm I'm curious, coming out of the military and, you know, it sounds like very kind of academic, professionally focused guy, like how did that first come across or or did you have any, I guess, preconceived notions or stigmas around psilocybin or psychedelics in general that came up for you when it was first introduced or was this a, you were 
pretty willing and able to jump into this. Yeah. I mean, I think I was willing, I had tried some, you know, mushrooms and things in my youth, but Mm -hmm. just recreationally and had had some good experiences and had actually had some bad experiences. So I think I was a little bit, you know, timid around it, but Mm -hmm. I was desperate, you know, and sometimes there's some beauty in desperation and rock bottom because it forces you to think kind of outside the box a bit. And so I was willing, I was at this point willing to try anything. And um, I trusted yeah. this group that I'd gotten to meet. And I was a bit fed up with the the system, you know, like I just yeah. saw it for what it was. I, I knew it wasn't serving me. I knew that the incentive structures were, were a bit broken and, you know, individuals actually healing and having long-term well-being wasn't necessarily in, in, in the system's best interest. Um, so I was, I was very willing. <laughs> exactly. Not a desired business outcome. Yeah. Right. Right. So you, you know, had this personal experience that gave you relief insight around the challenges you were having. Take us from there to Meckley in terms of like, how, how did the pieces come together? How did you get involved? What was the series of events that said, hey, look, this is a, I should take this from being kind of a, a personal solution to being something I want to bring out to the world? Yeah. So, you know, through grad school, I had quite a few, I had a few years where I was going quite deep on meditation. I went on lots of different long form programs. I went on more psychedelic experiences on the underground in the U S and in, you know, Central America Mm -hmm. and Mexico. And then I graduated school and was, I was doing better. You know, I was heading in the right direction, although it certainly wasn't a, a light switch. Um, and I was in my hometown, I was working on a startup with my brother that we had started when I was in grad school. I had good community. I was in nature a lot. I ended up doing a teacher certification in meditation. And, um, you know, my well-being was improving. A lot of my anxiety symptoms were going away. I was sleeping better. My relationships were getting better. And this whole time I had been deferring a job offer with McKinsey and company. And I got to another Mm -hmm. deferral cycle to keep working on this business. And they basically, they were like, no, (laughs) we're not going to be your permanent, (laughs) your, your, your permanent backup plan. And I I was like, okay, that that makes sense. And I had always wanted to see behind the curtain and I ended up going and, you know, part of me loved it. It is a, it's a, it's a really fascinating place to work. Yeah, really sure. intelligent people. I got to help co-lead um, and stand up the internal mindfulness program, which was pretty amazing. And I got, I was one of the first people to teach it as a service offering to clients as, you know, for performance enhancement. So I was getting to do some really cool stuff there. But the reality is, is that was kind of a pivot point in terms of my well-being going the wrong way, because it just wasn't really in alignment with me and the work this quite, you know, it's, it's, it's just not a, it's not a really healthy environment for well being, you know? And, um, I did a few years there. (laughs) It's challenging and people are just focused on, you know, different things. People are focused on climbing the ladder and maximizing their Mm -hmm. own material benefit. And it's just, it's a different mindset. And, um, I was there for a few years and then I ended up, you know, starting to struggle again. Some of my symptoms are coming back. And then I ended up, going into private equity, which was even more, you know, <laughs> off track for me, you know, the more, pot into the fire, <laughs> right? Like it just, it's just, you know, there are really great people that do do that work, but it's just, it's not my work. Oh, yeah. It's not for yeah. me. It's too money driven. It's not enough about like people and it's just out of alignment for me. And, you know, even if you're not consciously thinking about, oh, is this job the right job for me personally, blah, blah, blah. Like every day, your body is aware, like your body knows and um, Mm -hmm. your body will give you signals. And, you know, but at this point I'd gotten kind of lost in that rat race and chasing money. And, and then, you know, when you're in this anxious state and unfulfilled state and um, you end up spending a lot of money and then you need to make more money and it just becomes this bit of a vicious cycle that leads to a lot of unhappiness and emptiness. And then, so I got to this point after a few years of where I was almost back to where I was coming out of the military. And, (laughs) and, you know, so my, all my symptoms were back. I was having trouble sleeping. I was, my relationships were struggling. I was drinking alcohol again. And, um, and, you know, I was actually noticing these symptoms in a lot of my peers, you know, and these were people that hadn't mm-hmm. been to war. These were people that just had been living this intense corporate life for a long time and, and found themselves in this disconnected state. And I got to a point where I was just, I was like, I'm just done, you know, and yeah. basically money be damned to some extent. It was like, I got to find something that's more purpose, you know, purposeful and, and in alignment with me. And I left 
and I had been well before, you know, I had, I had had a period in grad school mm -hmm. um, where I was heading in the right direction. So I kind of just got back to the basics. You know, I got back into meditation. I got back into nature and kind of around a different group of people that were thinking differently. And then this thing with Beckley has kind of come together pretty serendipitously, which I think is a good signal. And I ended up in Mexico mm -hmm. and I started teaching meditation there. And then we were doing small, really simple programs where we would get a group together and do a bit of psilocybin and then go for a hike and meditate. And then we were doing, you know, single day programs and then multi-day programs. And then, you know, I'm watching what's happening in the world too, because, you know, I'm a, an entrepreneur and I, you know, I, I, I was paying attention to what was happening in the psychedelic space more broadly. And, and I got to this point where I was like, oh man, this is it. This is my life's work. I love this stuff. It's so fascinating. I know we can help people. The world needs it. And like the time is now. So then I started thinking about how to do this in a more, in a real way. And I started looking for partners. And then, you know, it was, it was pretty quickly that I ended up getting connected with the Beckley Foundation and Amanda and Beckley Waves, which is kind of the investment arm with her sons. And it was just like a pretty, a pretty amazing kind of match from the beginning. They had been looking for an operator that they thought could kind of scale an organization. And I was looking for partners that I thought were in it for the right reasons and not just looking to run another drug company playbook and maximize <laughs> revenue at the expense of everything, you know? And so yeah. Amanda has been doing this stuff for decades and it's always been about just helping people. You know, it never was about, it never was about profits. And so I knew that the ethos was there. I knew that the heart was there and now we're doing it together and it's, it's been really amazing. I think we're going to help a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. I'm always curious with founding teams. Like what, what, I mean, you mentioned kind of you being an operator, but like, what were the skills, capabilities that you felt you brought to the table? What were the things you knew you needed to kind of add, add to the mix to kind of round, you know, round the team out? Like how, how did yeah. you kind of see the, the team coming together and where were the overlaps and where were the gaps that you had to manage? Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's this like saying or whatever in all new ventures, you kind of need these three archetypes. One is the entrepreneur. This is the visionary. This is the the deal maker. This is the energy of the team. And um, that's an important role. And then you also need the operator, kind of the, the steady hand, the person that's making sure the trains run on time, detail oriented, <laughs> like yeah. policies and procedures. And then the third archetype is like the, the technical expert. So who has like the real deep wisdom and understanding and whatever the field is, you know? And so I had learned that in grad school and that was actually kind of you know, I was thinking about that when my brother and I started the business that we that we built. And I think just from nature and like my skill set, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, you know. I'm high level, I like big ideas, I kind of know where to go, have good intuition, but I'm not great at a lot of things, you know. So I need to pair up with people that have those complementary skill yeah. sets. And so I was looking for an operator and, and technical experts and and we found them. I'm two pretty amazing women that are on the team with me, you know, one Vian Morales is our is our you know most senior operations person. She was a former army officer. She's run big organizations. She's you know she's been an operator and she was running ketamine clinics. So she like gets it. Mm -hmm. And then actually you know two of the women that are on our you know, core leadership team, Jay Lorenz and Alexandra Palace, are both very steep in this work. You know like decades of experience working in psychedelics but also kind of just like the, the indigenous wisdom and the, and the spiritual mm -hmm. tradition. So, you know, us together, I think are a pretty good squad. And now we're trying to fill in even more around, around this core team. It's, um, it's been exciting, but for me, yeah. I'm always, it's always, I always try and test like heart and, um, and character first, you know what I mean? I think that sometimes mm -hmm. we index too much on aptitude maybe, or, or yeah, a resume and, and it's like, yeah, yeah. And it's like, that stuff's great. But you know, if you're trying to build a culture, particularly around this work, you got to make sure that the people that are living it and believe in it and do the work themselves. So I would say that the team is pretty, is pretty amazing in that regard for sure. Yeah. I'm curious in that you had, um, so you had this military experience, you had some startup experience, you had the McKinsey experience. I would guess what were the things that you felt you were able to kind of directly, immediately apply from those experiences into Beckley? And what were the things that you realized, hey, like I need to, 
I need to do this differently or I, I need to be willing to put some things aside in terms of how I think or how I kind of my strategies, like where did you have to kind of morph and change and adapt to, you know, this new context? Yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah, I think I, I did have like, you know, a pretty decent set of skills to kind of get something up and going. I mean, I knew how to put a strategy together that mm-hmm. I could communicate to other people to get like this core group, like rallied around an idea that, that I think I was like, a pretty natural skill set to me. I kind of know how to break things down into their component parts and set initiatives and then kind of, you know, this is even military stuff, troop to task, you know, make sure that you've got yeah. a prioritized list of the stuff you need to do and somebody's it. names next to it. Like that is, yeah. is relatively straightforward. I mean, some of the things that I'm learning on the fly and have had to leverage other people is I mean, the legalities around this stuff is super complex, yeah. and I don't particularly like. <laughs> I don't. I don't like law. Um, <laughs> it's not the, fun. <laughs> the the insurance is super complex, and I don't particularly love insurance. Um, so those have been yeah. those have been challenges, but it's 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 making me a more broad leader. And then you know the the really fascinating thing in this work that's challenging, but it's also really rewarding because. I think if we do it well, like we're bringing something very unique to the world. And that's like the, the talent management around these incredible artists, these like healers that have been yeah. mostly working on the underground for their entire lives and have been doing stuff kind of, you know, smaller scale, but want to be part of what we're doing because they want to be part of a, of this big vision, you know, and they want to be part of a broader team. And, you know, I think that we all benefit from it, but like, giving those artists like what they need and like bringing them above ground and like professionalizing kind of the, the, the industry mm-hmm. has been fascinating and challenging. And like, so there's like rubs, but it's to be expected because it's, it's relatively new. We're bringing this stuff that's, that's always been kind of off radar into the spotlight and like professionalizing it and, and making it legal and making it accessible. So there's going to be some, you know, like bumps and things along the way, but I believe in, I believe in, in what we're doing. Cause I think it's going to make it available to much, many more people. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the strategy, because I think I'm curious how you've kind of balanced or bridged, you know, kind of the big picture or or kind of higher impact you want to have versus, you know, the needs of running, uh, you know, a, a successful, profitable, financially viable business. Like where where did you land or how have you kind of evolved the actual business model and the, and the sort of the offering or the structure of what you're actually doing and like who you're actually kind of looking to help now in the future. Mm-hmm. Give me a little sense of how, how strategy has evolved. Yeah. I mean, I think that I believe that there can be conscious capitalism. I mean, some people think those are like oil and water and they'll never mix, but I think there's examples. <laughs> Antithetical that, terms. Yeah. I, 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 I think there's examples out there. I mean, you know, one that gets tossed around a lot is like Patagonia, you know, I mean, look at like we, as human beings, we do need clothes. We need things, right? Like, and Patagonia produces an amazing product that, like, is not just disposable. They'll repair it for you, you know. So it's not just like this this fast fashion thing that's just driving waste. And and they put their money where their mouth is. I mean, they have real give back programs, not like your standard BS marketing ploy that is um, a drop in the bucket relative to what the profitability is of the company. But they have, they're doing real stuff with their money. And I think that more companies can do that. And I think that, you know, that's what we're trying to be an example of. And, you know, I think that nonprofits are amazing and um, nonprofits are going to be out there in this world continuing to do great work, but they can be really limited. You know, not the nonprofit like structure and like the way yeah. it works, it's tough because you're always you're always asking for money. And then since you're not producing a product or a service, you're always at risk to like not being the flavor of the week anymore. And then you can't do what you need to do. And where I think a mission oriented heart centered business that produces a good or a service, but then has a real mission to not just like enrich the partners or enrich the investors, but like to give back and to make things more accessible and to drive more scholarship funds and then that can do a lot of good and then that can actually scale. You know what I mean? That can, that can mm-hmm. drive big impact. So, I mean, for us, you, mean, you can't give it all away before you build it. Right. So there is like a, a happy, <laughs> there is a happy medium to be had here yeah. and, and, and there's yeah. a middle path to walk. 
But you know, we're doing what we can even in the early innings. So we, we have scholarship programs that we've given away quite a few scholarships already. I mean, this fall, we're doing a program essentially at cost with a few nonprofits that's bringing just a group of women down to do a retreat. So we're getting to it. We're not even a big organization. And we're like, we're trying to do good work because to me, it's the right thing to do. And I want us to be an example of what I think like a conscious business can look like. And even if you're a cold hearted capitalist, I'm like, it's strategic. It's smart because look, people are going to vote with their dollars and, you know, people are going to want to support an organization that they really believe is doing good work. And by the way, we're going to get really good talent along the way because more people want to work with mission-oriented companies. So it's like, let's just do the right thing from day one and it'll, it's going to work out. And um, I think that, you know, we're, we're doing that, you know, next, next spring uh, in 2023, we are hundred percent funding a group of 15 veterans in partnership yeah. with Heroic Hearts to come down. So it's like, we're doing it, you know, we're not just talking about it. Yeah. And, and to talk to us about the retreats themselves, like the, I guess, but what, what's the kind of philosophy around what kind of experience you're trying to create? What do you hope to be kind of helping people with? Like, yeah. give me give me a sense of the intention and then the structure and what you've actually designed in terms of experiences. Yeah. Well, I mean, these programs, they can help people make very significant, positive, lasting change, you know? So, you know, our programs, technically right now, we're not, we are not treating any medical conditions because Mm -hmm. of the legality framework that we're operating in in Jamaica. So our programs are for for well-being. They're for the betterment of the well. But that that doesn't mean that people don't bring their stuff. Like everybody's got stuff. But (laughs) ours ours are are definitely more about like getting people to higher levels of empathy, like getting people to get have Uh deeper relationships, more clarity around what their purpose is being able to get out of these ruts and make like significant pivots and real change that that will make them feel better and and be better versions of themselves and i mean we're we're seeing that very consistently in in people coming through the programs and philosophically we're you know the Beckley Foundation has been studying this type this psychedelics for decades right so it's all mm-hmm. been about data and scientific rigor and we love that because we know we, we need to do that, right? We need to yeah. have standards because that's what's going to be able to get it to more people that are skeptical and want to see proof. And we need to prove it to ourselves. So we have a scientific approach, but we, we try and walk this middle path with some of the indigenous wisdom, right? And we feather in some of these practices throughout the program just so people can experiment with them. And nothing in our programs are we saying like, you got to do this. It's basically... It's a smorgasbord of experience around some different well-being practices, and you can take what you want. You know, whatever you feel is is impactful as you go through the program, you can adopt that as a practice if you like. And our programs focus on the basic well-being practices. So we teach meditation. We teach breath work. We encourage healthy eating habits. We get people in nature. We encourage people to spend you know, time with the right communities and support systems that will encourage them along this newer path. And, um, you know, structurally, what we saw was there was lots of individuals out there that were providing these mystical experiences, these psychedelic Uh experiences, but they were kind of just one off. Like you would go down, you could do a couple day program, and then you go right back into your old life. Really no connection. (laughs) Drop back in. Yeah. Yeah, you just drop back in. And, you know, do I think that's dangerous? I don't think it's particularly dangerous. Do I think that you're not getting as much out of it as you could. Heck yeah. I mean, you're just leaving so much on the table. So our programs are, they're 11 weeks long. And, you know, the first four weeks is digital. And that's a series of group calls where we teach some of the basic, you know, well-being practices. We get started some of the intention setting. We get the group dynamic started, which is important. And then we bring the group down. Um, You know, we're doing these programs in Jamaica and the Netherlands. And You know, we have five to six days in person at a beautiful location. And then we do these practices together as a, as a group and spend some time in nature. And then we have in those days, we have two psilocybin ceremonies or sessions. And those Mm -hmm. usually last about six hours long. And, you know, our groups are 15 to 20 participants. And with that, we usually have five to six facilitators. So it's like a very high facilitator ratio, which, which we like. So everybody's you know, got the right level of support. And, you know, the, the way we do our programs, you know, I've done, 
I've done a lot of these and, um, and we have a lot of people that come through and have done, you know, psilocybin recreationally or have done it in a one-on-one -on -one clinic model. And I'm telling you, this is different. Like you got to see it to believe it. It is a different experience when you bring together five, six trained facilitators that are kind of world-class and are true artists at this, this work. I mean, it's magic and you have to experience it. It's, it's really special. And, um, so then, you know, have a few days, you know, the five, six days in person, and then we, people go home and then we have six weeks of digital integration. And this is really important because, you know, what it looks like psilocybin's doing is it, it's putting the brain in this more of like a malleable state. And so uh -huh. you're, you're able to make more change in a shorter period of time if you do the work, if you do the work. And so yeah. this six weeks post you know, where we're having a group call every week and then having some exercises that people do on their own, you're laying in these new pathways. And this is what allows you to be able to make very significant change and keep that change instead of just like falling back into your old ways. And I guess what else are you learning around, I guess, why this works or how this works or, or what are the what are the key things someone needs to do to really benefit most from, you know, this this medicine? Yeah. Well, I mean, coming in, you want to get the central nervous system settled and you want to get the mind and the body in alignment. And typically, if you're living in the Western world and the corporate environment, <laughs> yeah. the central nervous yeah. system's triggered, right? Oh, and yeah. um, most of us are in a chronic state of fight or flight, you know, yeah. and, and what you want to do is you want to try and get the central nervous system a little bit more settled down. So you want to encourage people to do some of these practices that we know do that, like meditation, like the breath work. You want to try and encourage people to, you know, change their uh, yeah, very common thing we see and, you know, is everywhere is the standard upper in the morning, downer in the evening, yeah, right? Whether yeah, that's exactly. caffeine and alcohol or prescriptions yeah. or whatever, you know, if you're doing that regularly, your central nervous system is just, it's in fight or flight, right? So you want to yeah. encourage people to kind of chill that out a bit so that, so that, that there's not as much resistance to this change in consciousness that you get with psilocybin. It's, it, it's able to kind of, in a sense, like go deeper and do more. Um, yeah. And then, you know, the afterwards, it's, you got to, you know, if you really wanted to boil it down, it's like, got to get people to take better care of themselves right? <laughs> and, and be mindful about what they're putting in their minds and what they're putting in their bodies and who they're spending time with. And these practices like meditation is foundational, you know, nature there's a measurable energy exchange. There's a reason why we all go to the beach for vacation. It feels so good. It's like we need that. And um, so if you, if you give people these experiences and you give them the tools and you kind of coach them in this direction, you know, then you can, make, you can make real change. But that's why we really believe in like this comprehensive approach and not just the mystical experience. It's, it's, it's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, this has been a pleasure. If, if people want to find out more about you, about Beckley, what's the best way to get that information? Yeah, the, our website is a great place to start. It's it's just BeckleyRetreats.com, BeckleyRetreats.com. And then on there, I mean, my email is Neil at BeckleyRetreats.com. And, you know, I love this stuff and I, I love talking to people about it. And so people can, you know, reach out to me if they'd like. And um, we can talk more about these programs or meditation or consciousness or psychedelics or whatever people want to talk about. I really am happy to do that. So, yeah, no, it's clear you're, you're doing great work. I really appreciate the, the contributions that you're making to this, this whole community and the endeavor. So thank you. I'll make sure that the links are in the show notes and people can get that information and get your contact information. Neil, thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for listening to the Psychedelic Invest podcast. If you liked this episode, please be sure to leave a five-star rating and leave us a review. You can find more episodes on all the major podcasting platforms and our website at psychedelicinvest.com slash podcast.